America, this is your heritage. As you move forward, you finally get to 1892, and that's the first time the Democrats regain the presidency, Grover Cleveland, the House, and the Senate. They get all of that in 1892. So having regained everything in 1892, now Republicans got it under Abraham Lincoln in 1861, now Democrats get it back. They repealed every civil rights law. They repealed the Klan laws, the force laws, they repealed the anti segregation they repealed everything. So it's gone, and at that point is where you have the real introduction of the black codes. So since all the federal laws are off the books, now you have the southern states that start saying, we'll do a poll tax, we'll do property taxes, we'll do the grandfather clause. They go through 11 different legal ways to keep blacks from voting in the south. They had literacy tests, Alabama had literacy tests, and you think, well, what's wrong with making sure people can read before they vote? I mean, you got to read the ballot. No, no, no. These literacy tests in Alabama were over 20 pages long, and they weren't whether you could read or not. The, the literacy tests were things like, what rights do you have if you're indicted by a grand jury that's different from being indicted by a regular jury? Who knows the answer to that? But that's what they gave to African Americans, and they gave them such tedious tests that, of course, all blacks turned out to be illiterate. They couldn't vote. They also had what they called hide-and-seek polling places. They had Democrats vote over here, they had Republicans vote over here. Well, they would take the Republican ballots and move them around to different places throughout the day so that you couldn't find where the ballot was. So that was part of what went on. As a matter of fact, lest people think that we're really just kind of picking on stuff here, this is part of the presidential election of 1928. It starts up top, it says, what happened when the Republican Party was in power in Alabama? This is a picture of the 1872 Alabama legislature filled with whites and blacks. They go on and say, now, if you believe in white supremacy, vote the straight Democrat ticket November the 6th. This is not a pejorative. That's a statement of fact. It was not until 1944 the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the Democrat policy that said blacks cannot be elected to office as Democrat. And I heard you correctly. You said 1944, 19, not 1944. 1944. Now, the first Southern Democrat elected to Congress was in 1972, and that was Barbara Jordan, uh, and that was Andrew Young. Now, how did they get elected out of the South as a Democrat in 1972? Because the Supreme Court had just issued a ruling that told the Democrat legislature of Georgia and the Democrat legislature of Texas to redraw lines so that a black could be elected. They gerrymandered lines to keep blacks from being elected. Had it not been for the Supreme Court getting involved in telling the two Democrat legislatures to redraw lines, those two blacks would not have been elected. So the, the whole black history aspect, it's a very partisan thing, but we hear nothing about it, but it is so well documented. Although history is clear that there have been major differences in how political parties treated black Americans, neither party is completely blameless in all of its actions, nor have all the leaders in a party always been good or always been bad. Understanding this truth, Representative Robert Brown Elliott, even though he was a strong Republican leader in his day, wisely advised. I am a slave to principles. I call no political party master. I have ever most sincerely embraced the democratic and representative ideal, not indeed as represented or professed by any political party, but by its true significance as transfigured in the Declaration of Independence and in the injunctions of Christianity. Eliot's admonition is wise, aligned with political candidates that conform to what he called the injunctions of Christianity. Republican Frederick Douglass, who served as a minister of the gospel, had agreed, declaring, I have one great political idea. That idea is an old one, is widely and generally assented to. Nevertheless, it is very generally trampled upon and disregarded. The best expression of it I found in the Bible. It is in substance, righteousness exalted the nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14 and 34. Now this constitutes my politics the negative and positive of my politics and the whole of my politics. I feel it my duty to do all in my power to infuse this idea into the public mind that it may be practiced. Douglas was right. As citizens, we must vote righteously. And by the way, this first assumes that we are voting. This responsibility to vote and to vote righteously has been made clear from generation to generation. 
One such voice heralding this responsibility was that of Charles Finney. Finney was a famous American revivalist, a leader in the American revival movement called the Second Great Awakening. He was also the president of a college that even decades before the Civil War admitted both black and white students as equals. Reverend Finney wisely admonished, The time has come that Christians must vote for honest men and take consistent ground in politics. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this manner, but the time has come when they must act differently. Christians seem to act as if they think God does not see what they do in politics, but I tell you, He does see it, and He will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics. So when voting, no vote should be cast solely on the basis of any party. The values of each individual candidate must be examined using the standard of biblical righteousness cited by Frederick Douglass, the principles of Christianity as cited by Robert Brown Elliott, and an awareness that voters will answer to God for their vote, as pointed out by the Reverend Charles Finney. I had no idea that the passage of civil rights only happened under the Republican Party because today you would think that the Democratic Party would yeah. be the one that was really fighting for the civil right. rights and so it's again been changed 180 degrees in my now, mind. Matt, what you just said uh, about, well, Republicans passed all these civil rights laws, immediately people think, no, wait a minute, time out, that's not right. 1964, the Civil Rights Act, 1965, the Voting Rights Act, that was done by Democrat President Lyndon Baines Johnson. All right, let's talk about that for a minute. Okay. You go back to the 64 Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act, 64 first and Civil Rights, 65 and Voting Rights, that was really introduced by Democrat President John F. Kennedy. It was introduced as a result of the riots that occurred in Birmingham. We're having all this racial tension and riots, and he said, we've got to do something about this. Well, let's, let's do the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. So these, these will be the first Civil Rights Acts in 89 years passed by Congress. So what happens is JFK wants to do this, but both of those acts had been previously introduced by Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower. They were both killed in the Senate by the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, a Democrat. And so now that we've got the racial tension, Democrats have killed the Civil Rights Act, they've killed the Voting Rights Act, but now we've got this racial tension, Democrat president says, let's do this. So he goes back to the Republicans and said, your bill, will you guys help me do this? So it's moving forward. It comes through LBJ, because JFK gets assassinated, so now LBJ picks up the mantle, moves forward with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. It goes into the Congress for a vote. Now. Congress at that time was two-thirds Democrat in the House and the Senate. You got a Democrat president, Democrat House, Democrat Senate, two-thirds. It only takes a simple majority to get a bill passed. It only takes 269 votes to pass any bill through the House and Senate if you have control. So they've got 315, they need 269, they got 50, 60 votes to blow. They only came up with 198 votes on the Civil Rights Act. Democrats had it totally in their power to passed the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, according to the records of Congress, they didn't even get close to it. Where'd the help come from? It came from Republicans who overwhelmingly, who voted nearly 83% of Republicans voted for those two acts, only 62% of Democrats voted for those two acts. Had it not been for Republicans, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 would not have passed. For more information on the American Heritage series, or to find books and other resources, visit wallbuilders.com. Through the American Heritage series, renowned historian David Barton communicates our nation's forgotten, godly foundations and encourages us to once again view history through a truthful lens. For only when we recognize and embrace God's hand in our history can America become all that it was intended to be. Through Wall Builders, historian David Barton seeks to rebuild the walls of America's unique religious, moral, and constitutional heritage by educating the public and encouraging people of faith to become active in strengthening America's great foundations. For more information on how you can become involved, visit wallbuilders.com.